today I'm really pleased to introduce two such individuals from totally different kinds of organizations that work together on all sorts of things to make good stuff happen um, on our coasts. So uh, I'm going to introduce them right now. Okay, so on the left, your left, uh, Stephanie Seekich Quinn. Stephanie is the Coastal Preservation Manager for the Surfrider Foundation. Um, which is, she will tell you more about, it's an international grassroots-based nonprofit that focuses on issues surrounding coastal and ocean health and access to it. Um, Stephanie has a really interesting... That's perfect. Okay, okay. mission Nailed statement, it. check, okay. Um, Stephanie has been with Surfrider for quite a number of years, but has several decades of experience working on advocacy as a... As a, as a person in civil society, so not working for the government, not working for the university, but working for these organizations that sort of fill the gaps between people and communities and, and change on the ground. Um, she has worked on all kinds of coastal issues from climate change and public lands management, conservation, clean water, marine protected areas, offshore drilling, environmental management. Um, she has testified for a great number of public agencies, and she's really good if you ever get to roll back the tape and watch her at the podium giving her public testimony. Uh, folks in my class, I will harp on you about public testimony. Um, it's hard to do well. She's really good at it. She's been incredibly effective. Um, she's, so of all this coastal stuff, it's amazing. She's actually from Colorado, so that just goes to show, I don't know what, but um, we're, we're really glad in California that we have her here working on behalf of those of us that want to go to the beach and be able to get there and safely enjoy it. So um, thank you for that. And I know I've left a ton of stuff off, but I'll she's gonna talk more about it filling the gaps. <laughs> to your right, <clears throat> you're also to your left, <laughs> um, to Stephanie's left, my right, uh, Nick Sadrapur. So Nick is the, I'll get it right, the Science Research and Policy Specialist for the University of Southern California Sea Grant College Program. So I, I expect that he'll tell us a little bit about what the Sea Grant College Program is, but it's this really amazing state-federal partnership to leverage <coughs> money to take science from universities and put it in the hands of people in the communities like Stephanie, who then use it to advocate for better policy, better change on the ground. Um, Nick has a really cool background as well, and I know they're, they're both going to talk about it because I, I told them that they should. Uh, but in his job, he gets to basically partner with everybody that he can to make neat stuff happen for our benefit. Um, and so they'll, they'll talk about this. Uh, before he came to Cal UCS USC, there's Sea Grant's complicated in California, but before he came to USC yeah. Sea Grant, um, he was a California Sea Grant Fellow. Um, hopefully they'll talk about that fellowship program as well, because that's the kind of thing that um, those of you that finish the USRM degree and you want to go to just like a little bit more school, or maybe you get a master's degree, these fellowships are really amazing opportunities to um, find your way into jobs like his. Um, he has a master's degree in coastal and watershed science and policy from CSU Monterey Bay, um, but he is a native of Los Angeles, so he's back with us in Los Angeles. And um, so I, I left stuff out, so I thank you for filling in the gaps. And forward is forward, back is back, red is laser, and I don't know what the other buttons do. Thank you guys very much for being here. So a warm welcome. Thanks, Dan. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Nick Sadapur. And so I take it everybody's here because you're interested in the environment in some way. For me, I was always interested in the ocean and being outside. Um, and going to college, I kind of didn't really know where to put that forward. So uh, one day in class, a professor wrote up uh, this organization called SQUIRP. It stands <laughs> for the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. And he said, they're hiring for some interns for the summer. And I emailed the guy, and I got a job uh, going to the beach in the morning, picking up some buckets of water, taking it to the lab, and processing it. And for me, that was like the coolest thing ever to be able to just go to the beach and get paid somehow. Um, but through this position, I was kind of got curious about what are they doing with this? You know, I figure some, maybe the cities monitoring the beaches to make sure it's safe for swimmers and surfers to go out there. But you might not know that right now, many of the municipalities, they test the water using traditional media plates. 
So you run the water through a little filter, put that filter on the media plate, grow some bacteria, it takes about a day. So then they read that plate the next day and they say, hey, the beach was dirty, we're gonna close it. But from a management perspective, that doesn't really make sense, right? So we're testing the, we're testing the beach today and tomorrow, we're gonna close it if it was dirty. It doesn't really work. So at this job, what we were doing is using a DNA-based method alongside the media method to see, hey, maybe we can close it in seven hours or 10 hours. So we were running this, and this whole time I'm like, huh, that's pretty cool. These science nerds are figuring out a way for me to go to the beach and you know, be healthier and help people go to the beach and not get sick. And that kind of started my mind down the whole science policy interface of how you can have innovative research that can help direct management decisions for the enjoyment of our oceans and coasts. So I worked there for a couple summers, doing some cool projects up in Malibu, down in Doheny in Orange County, and it really got me spinning of, oh, this is a neat field. I wanna be in this ocean coastal science policy realm because there's some unique things that scientists might know, like doing a DNA method that takes seven hours instead of a media-based method that takes you know, a day, that could help really inform management. And during this time, I really got into scuba diving, which is pretty fun. You guys have plentiful resources of islands and <laughs> coves and reefs out here. And I started volunteering for this organization called Los Angeles Waterkeeper, doing some kelp forest restoration, looking at urchin barrens. Um, it might be an issue that some people know about here. Uh, this was mostly off of Palos Verdes coast, where uh, these purple urchins have really just decimated the giant kelp mac macrocystis populations. So I did that for a little bit and applied to grad school as as we do when you get interested in <laughs> science and start kind of pulling at, oh, what am I interested in? How do I how do I keep learning more about something? And I, as Dan said, I went to Cal State Monterey Bay. Uh, so it's cool to be back in a new Cal State. I haven't been there. It's a beautiful campus. And as part of my graduate program, I had to intern for a professional organization. And I got an internship actually in Ventura office for the California Coastal Commission. And the California Coastal Commission is the regulatory, the state regulatory authority for development in the coastal zone. The coastal zone is a very flexible definition. It's uh, drawn by legislature, by the legislature, and at some places it's a couple, couple hundred or a thousand feet, and some places it's about five miles. And within this internship, you know, you get permits for people who want to build a home. You get permits for people who want to build a trail and you evaluate based upon the California Coastal Act whether that, um, that permit application complies with the law or maybe there's some things that need to be changed within it or there needs to be some mitigation. So that was another experience into how science can help um, inform decision making at the planning permitting level. And uh, after that internship and I graduated uh, with a master's degree, I applied for uh, the California Sea Grant uh, State Fellowship, which puts uh, recent graduate students into state agencies to promote science within that agency. And the agency I got posted with was the California Ocean Protection Council. So as a, a surfer, I begrudgingly moved 100 miles inland to Sacramento, uh, where it's really hot in the summer. <laughs> and, uh, had to wear a suit every now and then to work, which was kind of weird. It's not a wetsuit, it's very, very <laughs> different. But you get to be exposed to um, appointed officials, elected officials. You get to be exposed to career staffers for councils, for committees, people who've worked for a state agency for decades. And it's a much different perspective than a traditional academic perspective or uh, an advocacy group like a nonprofit. And that's kind of where I've developed my, my whole thought process about how to be most effective about um, informing government and informing planning processes. And it requires working with an advocacy group. It, it involves working with scientists. It involves working with elected and appointed officials and agency staff and academics to help make the best decision that we can with the resources and the information. So that's a little bit about my background. I think Steph's gonna talk about hers. Yeah. So how many people were born around 1995? <laughs> okay, so your existence on the earth as long as I've been doing this work. So this is me in college in 1995. Uh, I worked with the Copergs, uh, the Colorado Public Interest Research Group. And they had two internships that were available. 
And the one I wanted, um, I didn't get because someone put in their application before me, and it was the environmental internship. And so I got stuck doing the homeless internship. <laughs> and then once the, the advisor was like, why did we choose? So they switched me back to where I was supposed to be. So this is my very first activist. <coughs> we slept outside in Colorado. I think it was 20 <laughs> degrees or something, it said all night to raise awareness about homelessness. And then the next day I started my environmental internship position. <laughs> um, and then I decided that I really wanted to be an activist, like a hardcore activist. Like I wanted to learn how to testify. I wanted to learn how to stop projects. I wanted to be hardcore. I was a budding 19 year old, super optimistic. The naive, the naivety, uh, the being naive a little bit and just really hoping I could change the world. Really hoping I could change the world. And so I heard about this program at the University of Montana, and it was called the Environmental Organizing Semester, and it was basically put on, and they garnered people from all around the country who started the environmental movement. And we were talking about like Rachel, um, Rachel Carson, who did Silent Spring. Um, some people had worked with her. Lois Gibbs did Love Canal. I'm sure we know that. Um, a lot of older people's names I won't drop because you might not know them, but <laughs> they were super influential and I was completely starstruck and in awe of, of being able to do this. And so I moved to Montana um, to be trained how to be an environmental activist. And it was a six month program. However, as you see, we landed on the front page of USA Today, a lobbying company found out that this activism degree was happening at the University of Montana and they said you're using public funds to basically train environmental activists and they had accused that we were going to go and you know um, mess up their logging operations and whatever and so the program was canceled and so I was one of the first people to be able to do this program that drove me to who I am and still am today and I think Nick and I are pretty unique maybe some of you in this room are in the same position and if you are I, I choose and just pray that you guys can continue knowing what you're going to do. I mean, I had a lot of friends that like drank a lot of beer and smoked a lot of pot in college before they figured out what they were going to do, right? And I knew, like literally graduating high school, I'm going to do this. Um, and here I am nearly 25 years later. I'm getting exhausted, I'm not going to lie, but I am a mom <laughs> of a seven-year-old. So it's the balance. And I think Dan wanted us to bring this up about like, what's your path? How'd you get here? And you know, if you choose to take a course like this, if to be an activist or to be a policy person, you know, measure where you're going and measure your output and your input. And that's just really a classic, awesome life lesson that no one really told me. Um, so I, after graduating college, I did volunteers in service to America. It's basically like the Peace Corps, but in America. And I taught environmental studies at a low income school for one year. They pay you in food stamps. Um, that was the most humbling experience I've ever had in my entire life. Um, and after I did that, I was like, you know, I really like this like policy and law stuff. Like, I want to learn more about it. And so I was fortunate enough to land a job with a group called the Western Land Exchange Project. And they, this is totally wonky. <clears throat> I hope I don't bore anyone if it's really quick. Um, they would monitor land exchanges between the federal government, the Bureau of Land Management, and the Forest Service and private logging corporations. And there's there's a law that allows you to do land exchanges. And so you can see right here that um, this land was once ours in 1900. Um, we traded it to Weyerhaeuser, which is a logging corporation. They had it for 90 years. They clear cut the heck out of it. And then they went back to the, the federal government and said, okay, let's switch again. So we called it rock and ice. We gave them a forest and we got back rock and ice because there was no more forest. Mm -hmm. And this literally made me irate. I was like, there's loss, there's policies. This can't happen, this is crazy time. Um, and so then I said, ah, screw this, I'm going to graduate school. I'm gonna learn <laughs> more about law and policy. So I upped and moved to um, England. I went there for a master's in environmental law and policy and really was able to dive into the significance of environmental law. And I found myself like moving away from this like hardcore, like earth first activist um, to, to get into this realm because you have to know your science and you have to know your policy in order to be an effective advocate. So those lessons really converged um, on me and it was, it was just really serendipitous and fortunate. I was able to kind of see all those three things moving around. Um, but now I'm gonna fast forward to what my organization does, as Dan said, we are a coastal organization that 
works to protect our oceans, beaches, and waves for the enjoyment of all people. And um, we have several clever little campaigns. Um, this one's called Hold On To Your Butt. And um, in 2006, the city of San Diego, which is where I live, um, we banned smoking on our public beaches. And I'm not gonna lie, I've been known to have a cigarette when I have a cocktail on me. And so I was like, you know, I feel kind of <laughs> bad for all these people who are gonna feel ostracized about being kicked off the beach. And honestly, a lot of smokers were pissed at us. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. They were like, this is the like, First Amendment, like you're taking away my rights. And so I was like, well, let's not ostracize them. Let's, let's buy these little ash cans and stick them around where people we know will go to smoke and see how it works. I don't know. And I got a grant and I got like, I don't know, five of them or something. And now, fast forward 12 years later, I, I can't even count how many things we have of these all over the country and Europe. Um, and what we did with this, talking about merging and engaging, um, we engaged the local municipality to maintain them, to, to take out the butts. Um, they passed uh, like an ordinance codifying that it was okay to do this. Um, we brought out the public so that they knew where they were. Um, so all these levels of engagement from government, public, um, and then of course the media. And look how young I am. <laughs> <laughs> Just teasing. 12 years of my past. Um, and, and having the media there was perfect because most people didn't know there was a smoking ban and they took sympathy. They were like, wow, that was really thoughtful of you, Starfighter. And so we were able to assuage some of the concerns of smokers. And the reason why we care about cigarette butts is because it's the most littered item in the world. There's 4.5 trillion cigarette butts that are littered a year. Um, they're made of cellulose acetate, which is plastic. So they never fully biodegrade, they just photodegrade. And photodegrade means that it's basically broken down by the sun. Um, they also absorb um, the toxins that you know, the smokers are basically putting into the filter. And when they're into waterways, they actually re leach um, chemicals. And I worked with the University of San Diego and we did a study where they were able to prove <coughs> that certain smelt in rivers that were exposed to these toxins from the cigarette butts were actually being poisoned. So that's the reason why we care. Um, and this is kind of chronological. Of, um, Surfrider does a lot, which I'll get to in the end. But then I started working on, Surfrider started working on marine protected areas. And basically marine protected areas are areas of the ocean that we set aside and we restrict um, extraction. So extraction is in the form of either commercial or recreational fishing, um, offshore oil drilling, kelp harvesting, anything that's going to extract from that area. And they can be different sizes and shapes. So this is kind of what they look like. So this little blue swath right here, this red swath, they each have different regulations. But the California um, coast has, a, basically it's like, an. Any, un, unlike any other place in the world, there's no other country that has put aside these areas for marine protected areas. And the idea is that when we set them aside, um, <coughs> the animals and the creatures that live within there essentially start to procreate and the flora and fauna become so thick and then they spill over and they basically spread out and continue to build healthy ocean, ocean ecosystems. Um, and it's tremendous, some of the science, I mean, I'll have Nick explain it later, but here's the deal, it wasn't easy because we had angry fishermen, which I completely understand, right? Like, I mean, that's their livelihood. And so some of the best places where you want to keep safe for future generations of habitat are also where they fish. So three years of my life is when I started getting gray hair. Um, <laughs> and we had to really, and Surfrider is very unique because our members are, we are very diverse. We are very, 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 we're not like the Sierra Club where we all just like have granola and like hike around. Like we have, we literally have people. <laughs> <laughs> of, <laughs> sometimes good bars, sometimes. <laughs> um, but uh, some of our members are fishermen, right? And so they, you know, we, so we had to engage them. Um, and then we had to go to all these public forums. And thank you for praising public testimony because it is literally where the, where the rubber meets the road. It is how you change policy. It is how you change anything you want to. It's how you get elected officials to actually perk up and listen to you. Um, I can't explain to you how important it is for you to do that. And if you just want to try, go to like your town council or your planning commission where there's like six people there and be like, hey, mm -hmm. I care about climate change. What are you guys doing? And you know, and just start practicing. Anyway, so 
we did public hearings for three years. And then we were like, now we have to educate people. So this is 2012. Um, and we did a roadshow. We went up and down, um, this is for the Southern California coast, and basically explained to people like, here's your opportunity to be a citizen and engage and understand what these marine protected areas are. We had fishermen that showed up and screamed at us. Um, and then by the end of the time we were hugging and they got it and it was really intense and it was emotional. And these marine protected areas are now proving to be one of the best investments that California has ever done. Um, so right on the tail of doing all these marine protected ar areas on the coast, um, so up in like San Luis Obispo, there's Diablo uh, nuclear power plant. I don't know if you guys know where that is. Um, so essentially, it sits on a fault line, and I, you'll remember why I did this. Um, and so it's owned by PG&E. So PG&E was like, you know, we, you can go to the federal government and get a license to be open as a power plant, and if you don't continually do that, you will be shut down. You have to get permits to, especially for nuclear power plants. And so one of their permits was up, and so they were trying to say, we're by a seismic fault. We need to do seismic testing. And seismic testing is a horrific, I don't have time to get into it, horrific, horrific practice. Essentially, you're shooting air guns through the ocean that penetrate the ground that basically give imaging of what's underneath there, whether it's a fault line or oil and gas or other ways to do it. And I'm oversimplifying it. But what it does <coughs> is essentially they do it every 30 seconds for 30 days, 24 hours a day. And it is the equivalent of a bomb <coughs> going off for marine life. It is extremely damaging. Just Google seismic testing marine life, but don't do quick images. Don't. Um, and so, we were like, wait a minute, so they're gonna go and do seismic testing in a flippin' MPA? Like, we just made this marine protected area, and for the whole reason of not killing anything in there, the state law says don't do that, you're gonna go ahead and do that? And then, um, I actually, un I discovered a document um, that said, if the Navy did testing, and the Navy said if a surfer or an ocean recreationalist happens to be in the water, and they receive more than 140 levels of decibel, they will be, and it was like this list of just outrageously freakish things that can happen to you from seizures to your eardrums rupturing to, I mean, you name it. Um, and I was like, how can, I was like, literally like, I'm, I called my boss, Chad, and I was like, am I reading this right? Like, I never would believe that they would allow something like that to happen. Then I read through and I'm like, they don't even have like a mechanism to tell recreationalists like get, to get out of the water if they're gonna do it. So it ended up becoming this huge campaign. We were fighting the federal government. We're fighting one of the biggest utilities in the world, PG&E. Um, there was no way we thought we were gonna stop the project, but we did. And how did we stop it? All of these people showed up and all of these people testified. People talked about everything from their own impacts to marine impacts. Um, and it was, it was pretty amazing. Um, and they wanted to keep up you know, and open the, uh, the nuclear power plant. And because they weren't able to do their testing, they are no longer open. They are now shut down as a facility. And it's not like we were driving to do that, but as you now know, San Onofre is being shut down. Nuclear power is on its way out. So it was essentially like a blessing in disguise that we stumbled onto this campaign because we saved a bunch of marine life, um, even though we knew this would probably be closed down and so did they. Here's another like discovery. Uh, this involves less public participation, um, but it was another like, oops, kind of like Aaron Brockovich thing, like you, just people put stuff in documents and you're like, you, you're not supposed to do this if you don't want the public to know how bad this is or, or you've been hiding something from us, lying to us forever. So we're in the land of oil drilling, offshore oil drilling. So all these rigs here are in federal waters. So this is state waters right here. So this little line right here, and this is three miles. And anything out here is federal. So essentially, these big platforms were doing offshore fracking. And everybody knows fracking. They've seen the movie and you know, fire lighting their drinking water. <laughs> and we, again, we just literally could not believe. We're like, no, it's California. Like, California wouldn't allow fracking off our coast. There's no way this would happen. Uh, we'll come to find out, essentially, what the oil companies were doing is working with the federal government underneath the Clean Water Act. And they got an exemption, which allowed them to frack 
and then discharge their chemicals directly into the ocean. Also near all the NPAs we just <laughs> set up. <laughs> so um, essentially my, my colleague from the Environmental Defense Center here in Santa Barbara, if you don't know about them, they're amazing, donate, help them. Um, they're a really small local nonprofit. Um, we basically cracked them. We just said, you can't do this. And the Coastal Commission flipped. They were like, they were gobsmacked because they know everything. The Coastal Commission is like the uber power agency. And they had zero idea this was happening. So we were able to essentially um, commission a study, my friend and I did. Uh, we researched all the different laws and regulations that they ought to be doing. And we called for this. We called for a moratorium. Moratorium means just complete ban, stop um, fracking offshore and that the oil and gas companies and the federal government, all governments for that matter, state and federal, um, need to conduct a proper environmental impact statement. You know, that's, you, I'm sure you know what that is at this point. Because um, they weren't doing that because they got the waiver. So we were forcing them to do that. Um, and then to provide independent scientific studies of like, what is what, what are the chemicals? Because they didn't have to disclose it because they got the loophole. So we had no idea what was in there. And we needed someone independent to tell us what to do. Um, and then this is Stan, ooh. This is Dan's whole jam, right? Like, public process, public engagement. They weren't doing that. Even our own agencies didn't know that that was happening. Um, government takes a long time. As Dan was saying, things take a long time. Um, this problem still isn't necessarily solved, um, but it's been shown to light, and it's in a better situation. But also just kind of freaky that nobody knew this was happening. And then we fast forward to, does anybody know what this is? Deepwater Horizon. Deepwater Horizon. Um, the oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Uh, it was horrific. Um, I was actually only working on oil drilling at that time for Surfrider. And um, so after the spill happened, there were a bunch of, we call, does anybody know what an NGO is? Okay, cool. So they, they convened a bunch of NGOs, non governmental <coughs> organizations to come down to the Gulf of Mexico and meet with fishermen, everyone that was down there in the bayou. Um, you couldn't name it mom, pa, people, people who barely even understood environmental laws and policies to come together and create a recovery plan. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to go down there and walk the beaches, see where the oil was, and then work with all the, the fishermen and the local communities to basically be able to bounce back from this really horrific incident. Um, and that, that involvement component of it was fascinating because it was just like real people, right? Like the activists I'm showing there, like you get a rush out of being an activist and like you get invested, but like these people are like, I don't even want to do this. Like this came to my door. Like this is now my problem and I'm forced into it. So it was like a backwards engagement. They had to back in to being involved. Um, and so they became environmental advocates at the end of the day, unbeknownst to them. What's this? Can you remember this image? Just from <coughs> Is that the Rafizian spill at Rincon? Actually, this is, um, it's Refugio State Beach. Oh. Right here, this, this particular picture. So he's a local surfer, and he was out there, and it's just crazy how he was able to capture um, the oil in a breaking wave. So it was fine, they thought they contained it. Um, remember, they were like, it's no big deal. And you guys all know there's natural seepage here, but because there's so much oil here on the, the ocean floor, we have natural seepage. It is what it is, and Jack Johnson has a about it, so. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we were told, okay, great, so you're gonna clean this. There, you know, the Department of Fish and Wildlife was like, we got it. And then we were down in Orange County, which is 70 miles south of the spill, and oil started popping up, and we called I mean, this is such a convoluted story, I have to cut it super short, but we called federal and state agencies and we're like, there's oil everywhere and we're convinced it's from Refugio. And they're like, we're convinced it's natural seepage. And we're like, no, we're not. And so um, <laughs> we forced them. I made lots of lovely enemies in the Department of Fish and Wildlife um, because I was like, you need to test. You need to get out here and cut out transects and test um, your natural seepage because as you know, in university you have fingerprints so every piece of oil has a fingerprint like we do. And they keep them, you know, cataloged. So great, if you were to go and do a transect and you'd see the fingerprint, and be like, oh yeah, this is from our natural seepage fingerprint catalog. They refused to do that. The other side of gray hair started coming in. 
And <laughs> it took months and months and months to force them. And at this point, the, we're like, you can't even prove the oil because the oil that's coming up is like, it's, it's disappearing. Um, they said no. But one of my friends um, were like, we're just going to figure out a way around this. And we went to a private lab. And we raised money. And they tested it. And it traced back to Refugio. And the Department of um, Fish and Wildlife and Beaches and Harbor in Los Angeles were the first to be like, we messed up. I'm so sorry. You're right. Um, and it's not like we're looking for the NBA, you're right. But it's like, you just literally wasted all of our time. And when you look at some of the beaches where oil was washing up, there's children, like small children running on the beach. Um, and I would go out every weekend, and I ruined like five pair of flip flops. So <laughs> I was like, Plains was the, the company that spilled it. I still am going to charge them for flip flops. But um, at the same time, legislatures, in fact, a lot of legislators from this area, Hannah Beth Jackson, Lois Capps, I mean, this, this, this whole area is so oil industry aware. But then, you know, the oil spill that happened in the 60s produced a lot of intelligent elected officials who hawk offshore oil drilling. And so they started introducing all this legislation left and right. Like, you have to notify if it's traveled. Like, too much to get into right now. Um, so Patagonia calls me, and they're like, I can't believe you guys cracked this. Like, it's Refugio Oil. They're like, we want to do something super cool with you. So they're like, let's paddle out to Platform Holly, and we will build you this um, banner hashtag crude awakening. And when people go to crude awakening, it'll have all the pieces of legislation and all the articles that you exposed the refugio spill. And it was like, we're like, wow, Patagonia. Like, this is like Christmas. Thank you, because this is what we need to raise awareness. So we had a bunch of our activists paddle out. This is of a swim, just to you know. <laughs> like, I did not do it. I was like, bye. Um, so they did. They went out there and they unfurled this, and we got some national attention, um, and all of our legislation passed. So again, a different kind of involvement from corporate sponsorship, awareness, to now social media <coughs> influencing legislation. So you could be a, a like a slacktivist is what we call them, where you can just look around and do action alerts and tweet and all the hashtaggy stuff. Um, but hey, you know what? I'll take it. It worked. We passed legislation. <laughs> Um, and this is an event we do and have been doing since the Deepwater Horizon. It's called Hands Across the Sand. Um, this just happens to be s uh, snapshots from California, but we do it all over the country. And it literally is people taking a stand for offshore oil drilling. Um, and the tagline is, no to offshore oil drilling, yes to clean energy. And it's just a fantastic thing to do. It's total like kumbaya, goosebumps, and you, know, you feel like you're, again, engaging. Um, I've seen like people come and cry. They're like, I've never done any environmental activism, but this is so awesome. Um, so keep your eye out because we do this every uh, May. And to the final project, <laughs> <laughs> um, have you guys heard of the Save Trussell's campaign? A couple people, yeah. Um, so essentially, it was a proposal to build a six-lane toll road through San Onofre State Beach, which is in Orange County. It's the fifth most visited state park. It has 2.5 million people, and it has trestles, the most um, famous surf spot, arguably, in the mainland. Um, and basically, this is what it would have looked like. And it would be 16 miles, so it would go way, way, way back into the watershed. Um, it would have gone through Native American heritage sites, sacred sites. Um, there's habitat where there's 12 endangered species. Obviously, the state park component. I mean, it was just. It was one of those things where like, this is so wrong. Like, how could anyone dream up this project? Because it is ridiculous. Like, you're pissing off so many different constituents here, from Native Americans to environmentalists to recreationalists in between. Um, and it has been a 15-year campaign for me. And um, talk about engagement. So the, people have actually written a book. There was a book written recently uh, that included information about this hearing right here. Um, and essentially, it happened in 2008 at the Coastal Commission. And there were 4,000 people that showed up to save a state park. It's never been done historically. I mean, we've looked even around the country to, to see, because public hearings are very different from like a protest, right? Like, 
And you sit there for hours, you listen to these commissioners drone on. People normally come in, they're like, later, I'm out, like this is a lot, you know? Um, so for 4,000 people to engage and stick around um, was tremendous. And actually, we had all the cards stacked against us, and it was kind of like the seismic testing thing. We totally thought we were gonna lose. But this is the deal, and I'm done here. Um, when elected officials see a ton of faces, it scares them. Because why? They work for us. They work for us, and they need to be reelected. And they know if they make people mad during public hearings, they might go tell their friends, and they might not get elected again. So you basically can trap them in a way like that if you get enough people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so we won, and um, the toll road agency went to the federal government and was like, we don't agree with California's decision. It was the Bush administration, and we're like, oh, we're so screwed. We're, this is like, this victory's done. It's the Bush administration. And they were like, yeah, California, you're right. So the Bush administration held up our awesome victory, um, and it was great. We thought everything was going to be great. We did it. And then, of course, the toll road developers thought they were going to um, carve up the road and do it in segments. And so they tried to do that for like nine years, hence the rest of the gray hair. And um, we basically fought them tooth and nail. I mean, literally, not even like a silly analogy. Um, they are a billion dollar corporation and we're a nonprofit. And again, there's been case studies and books written about this campaign um, and our tactics and our way we engage the public um, to defeat um, the David and Goliath story, really. Um, so we settled a lawsuit recently with them, um, and the state of California joined us on our lawsuit. So they, once you win, it's like when you get rear-ended, right? Like you have to deal with insurance, and you, you shake it out, and you just deal with it. It's kind of how lawsuits settle. You know, you don't let a lawsuit languish or not be closed out. You settle. Um, and plus, we've spent 15 years of spending money as a nonprofit, so we wanted our money back. It's like damages. Like you rear-ended me, you pay for it. Um, and so we got back the money that we spent on our lawyers. Actually, not all of it, just which is a bummer, but it is what it is. Um, and so we settled the lawsuit, and we got permanent protection of the park. And this was like a year ago um, that we got permanent protection of the, of the park. And um, so now that we can't go through the park, the next logical place where it might go is next to San Clemente. And so the city of San Clemente is suing to undo our lawsuit because instead of wanting to, well you, you just all made the connection. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can't go through the park. Um, so unfortunately, you know, this lawsuit does put us in a sticky situation where we're kind of back to square one. Um, but we're gonna be positive and we're gonna keep the victory in place, I'm sure. And there's so much I didn't have time to talk about. Those are the hardcore policy, engaging public, media, decision makers, fishermen, constituency, recreationalists, things. These are big campaigns. But there's a ton of stuff that you can do through our organization, it's like just doing beach cleanups. Um, our rise above plastics, just you know, don't use straws. Straws are, well, again, a huge littered item. Um, we have a campaign, straws suck, like just don't use them. <laughs> if the, when they bring you to, um, at the restaurant, just say, no, thank you, I don't need a straw. So this is something that you can engage in, right? You don't need to show up at a hearing and be like, I know every law and policy. It's like, oh yeah, I am doing something. Um, Blue Water Task Force is where we do water quality testing. Uh, we do that all over the country. Ocean Friendly Gardens is removing um, grass or hard, um, non-permeable surfaces so that the soil can absorb water. Um, these gardens are also really good for climate change, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, Smart fin, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, is essentially a fin that goes on your surfboard that helps read um, oceanic conditions that helps us understand what's happening with climate change. Yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> Whoever said what, we'll talk about it. Um, obviously beach cleanups, these are, these are the best ways. I mean, this is like, this is where my daughter is right now. She's the beach cleaner. She's the seven year old, like training her early. But everybody feels really good when you do a beach cleanup and they're super, super, super needed in Southern California, unfortunately. Um, and then ocean-friendly restaurants is kind of in the same vein of um, reducing plastics and having your restaurant not have foam um, or plastic carry-out containers. Um, and then this is kind of a cheesy plug for a, a report <coughs> I just launched. We graded all the coastal um, states to see how they deal with um, their sand management. 
how they deal with building big homes or buildings on the coast, um, how they deal with coastal armory, meaning like seawalls, and then how they deal with um, planning for future sea level rise. And um, California was the only state that got an A. So, um, so that's kind of what the surf rider does. And I'm gonna hand over to Nick. Yeah. And uh, I guess I'll double down right now on something Stephanie said is getting involved isn't going to a hearing and necessarily being you know hardcore advocate and testifying. You can go and you know just show your support. Um, sometimes they'll just like wait, raise, raise your hand or you know you'll be a part of that big crowd in the room that's uh, for saving something like trestles and or you know local stuff. Malibu just banned plastic straws, so going to that city council meeting and saying I support this ban or you know, hey, maybe think about um, banning styrofoam in the city wherever you live. And Surfrider is a good organization to help you be clued into different campaigns that are going on in that city, county, or state level. So, I'll talk a little bit about Sea Grant. Um, I'm at University of Southern California Sea Grant. There are two Sea Grants in California. One is called California Sea Grant, and one is called University of Southern California Sea Grant. I work for that one. And we focus on urban ocean issues. There's about 10 million people in LA County. That's a whole heck of a lot of people. Uh, our primary objectives are we fund research. The bulk of our money comes from the federal government and we're in a partnership with the state. We get a little bit of money from the state and a little bit of money from the university and we have research competitions for these type of topic areas that you can see that affect coastal urban settings. And every other year we'll hold uh, what's called a request for proposals where a researcher will submit a proposal that has a management perspective. So it's looking at water quality to improve the management of it. It's looking at fisheries to improve management of fisheries. Other things we do are community outreach and education. Um, I'll talk a little bit about specific programs, but it's um, getting people out of the beach, talking to them about sea level rise, talking to them about how the city is looking at how to tackle coastal resilience and planning. And we also do technical assistance. Um, like some of my colleagues here, you know, we're on technical advisory committees or the city's hazard mitigation plan or science advisory panels for uh, the coastal segment looking to update their local coastal program. Uh, my boss is on one of the committees that manages the National Marine Sanctuary. So things like that where we are kind of that boundary organization, like Dan was saying, the, the translators and conveners, the dot connectors between state government, federal government, local government, and science. So we are part of NOAA. Who's heard of NOAA before in this room? Great. So this is our mission statement. Can anybody tell me one of the most words in there that maybe pops out that might not feel that it fits? Commerce. Somebody said that, yeah, commerce. So NOAA is within the Department of Commerce. Weird? Maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of shipping, fisheries, uh, yeah. a lot of things that commerce that need weather satellites. The National Weather Service is a part of NOAA. Shipping lanes. Shipping lanes. Uh, and all of that commerce is the real foundation for what we do. And you might think about, okay, so how does that work for USC? There's two of the biggest ports in the world and in North America are down in the Port of LA and Port of Long Beach. We have some of the highest number of tourists in Santa Monica and Venice that I'll show some pictures of later, and it's um, a huge economic resource is California's coastline. It's people going to beach, people recreating, people spending their money, living, and enjoying it. So in terms of research, oh, I'm sticker down a little mm -hmm. um, These are three new programs that apply to our federal funding, like I was saying, that we are currently funding. It's looking at how does artificial light affect wildlife on the coast. Maybe not something you think about every day, but I'm sure all the sky glow from LA has an impact on our coastal resources. It's looking at, hey, what if we, what are we doing out there with our algae that might help sediment dynamics for beach erosion? And how can that inform some of our management decisions? It's looking at new methods for water quality. I think this one's specifically for metals around ports and harbors. And you know that is directly related to some of the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, regulations, and we take these scientists who have done these researchers and we try to put them in front of audiences where they can really communicate what they're looking at. Uh, this guy here, he's awesome, his name's Doug George, he uh, 
He's a geological oceanographer, and we funded his study looking at uh, Point Dune, which is a headland down in Malibu. It's actually just east of this place called Broad Beach. Who's heard of Broad Beach before? And there's been a long history of uh, coastal private property owners uh, protecting their investment through <laughs> seawalls and proposed nourishment. So what his study That's looked very at... very diplomatic. It was so <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so what he looked at was, all right, at this headland, there's a mini submarine canyon up there. How much sediment actually gets around that headland? How much sediment gets lost to that marine canyon? If these homeowners get this huge nourishment that they're looking at and spending millions of dollars and putting it on the beach, how much of that's actually going to stay there? And how much of that might go around this headland? And how much is going to go off into the submarine canyon? So I won't spoil it, maybe a little bit. Most of it goes into the submarine canyon. Some of it goes around. Uh, but you know, within this room, this is a, a beach ecology coalition meeting. So you have state parks folks, LA County beaches and harbors. You have fish and wildlife. Um, lifeguards, firefighters, you have people from an advocacy group, so you have other scientists. I think Sean was at this meeting. Yeah, that was my bald head right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he's actually going to be presenting at the Malibu City Council meeting in a, couple, in a month. So it's our role is to take these researchers who are looking at this really cool science thing from a whole science side. It's really cool, but it's so applicable to management and definitely to some of the pol policy and political stuff going on. Um, particularly in Malibu. Another campaign we do is citizen science. This one's called Urban Tides. Who here has a smartphone? <laughs> cool. Me too. Uh, this campaign is uh, it's an app. It's called Liquid. Basically, the idea is we encourage people to go out at really high tides, um, especially the king tides that happen a couple times a year, and take photos of what they're seeing. Are they seeing you know, coastal managers moving sand to protect lifeguard tower? Are they seeing a, a resource, an asset, like a parking lot or a bathroom being flooded, being impacted by this natural phenomenon? Uh, are they seeing erosion issues? And with, when they take the photo, um, you can upload a GPS. You can say which way you're looking at the beach and write some notes about it. And this gets uploaded to our database. We work with the US Geological Survey on uh, the sea level rise modeling and coastal erosion modeling, and they can go in and look at, okay, there's about a six foot high tide. Let me go look at our model for about six feet in this area. Is it impacting this resource in our model? Because we saw it happen in real life, and it can help calibrate their model. So through this program, we do beach walks. Um, obviously, there's a lot of erosion here. I think this is down in San Diego. Yeah, it's like Pines. Yeah, yeah it's, it's either Torrid Pines or, yeah, might be Torrid. Um, so it's engaging communities. You know, these are everyone from people who like signed up for a listserv when we said we're doing a beach walk to only <laughs> people who just like parked down there and were like, oh, these people are gathered. Look at this. Road. <laughs> Let's see what they're talking about. <laughs> Another uh, program we were involved with uh, in with the city of Santa Monica is called Owls. It's one way we engage is like this is the mayor of the city of Santa Monica. And there's a nice grooming machine in the background. I thought I didn't realize that. <laughs> but um, so we. You know, these old telephoto lookers put in the quarter that aren't really around it too much anymore. We took these, and it actually has a virtual reality in it. Basically, it, you can pan and look at the beach and see kind of current day, current conditions. They're not really using it right, but it's a good photo. <laughs> so you see current conditions, then, you know, current with the flood, and potential adaptation strategies to help people get an idea about, oh, how will this beach be impacted by sea level rise? How is it impacted today on a really big storm? And what was really unique is Santa Monica Pier gets a whole lot of domestic tourists and international tourists. So within this uh, device, there were survey questions asking, you know, where you're from? How do you feel about sea level rise? OK, we're showing you these photos. Now how do you feel about sea level rise? And uh, this is kind of an attempt at getting to that people's perspective, and how do they think about climate change? How do they think about solutions to, add, to adapting to climate change? Can you tell us real quick what some of the reactions were? Or do you want to wait to the end? So the, da the data wasn't really great. As you can imagine, in a public place that's getting millions of people all the time, you know, there was a lot of people who went in there, hit a bunch of questions, and maybe not have been in good faith. Like there was a lot of the first answer was like a long time. Um, <laughs> but the coolest part about this was, I want to say like 60% of the people who did this selected that they were under the age of 30. 
It was like 15 to 30 is what they said. So that was pretty cool. Some of the interesting s stuff about the social science, really not, I don't think it's statistically defendable, was people who came in with a low concern had a high concern. People that came in with a high concern actually kind of dropped a bit. I think it was because, you know, this picture shows, oh, it looks like we're okay. Looks like the city's doing its due diligence and we're gonna be okay. We have a big white sandy beach, which Santa Monica does. Uh, yeah, That's yeah. Thank you. They, I think this is the first step in getting to a really successful engagement. Uh, who knows what this monstrosity is in pink? <laughs> no. Uh, this is the city of LA. Yeah, I wouldn't have joined it that way. But one of the programs we do is called Town LA. It's, it's, it's thinking about a regional um, aspect of planning for coastal resilience. Here's Malibu, here's Long Beach, Palos Verdes. There are 18 cities here. This is the city of Santa Monica. City of Santa Monica doesn't talk to City of LA about what they're planning for. You know, and what Sea Grant has done past about 10 years is try to get all these city managers, try to get the LA County who actually manages the beaches, try to get the state parks for some of the state parks people up in Malibu, where state parks manages, not LA County. Get them all in a room, get them talking to each other, get them meeting each other, get them sharing their ideas. What are they seeing on the ground? You know, when they interact with the public during a big storm, what are they talking about? What are their concerns? How are they managing flooding? beach nourishment, and kind of what sense of a regional regional planning can we accomplish? Those are always fun conversations. So it's like here we got a fire fire chief, this guy's a hardcore researcher, this is city planner for Malibu, this guy's from the Netherlands, he's a great guy, I'll talk about him later, showing us some cool adaptation that they've been doing, because the Dutch, man, they've been doing adaptation to water forever, <laughs> and he has the coolest attitude about it. So it's getting all these people in the room who are from so many different backgrounds, so many disciplinary, and having them engage together, talking about similar issues so that we can develop a shared understanding of what do we want to preserve for the future. So talk a little bit about engagement. Um, elected officials, mostly on the local side. Uh, we interact a lot with appointed officials at the state level. A lot of working groups, science advisory panels, like I was saying, and academia for funding research. It's a little bit different than what Stephanie interacts with, but it's a very similar crowd. We were kind of talking today about it's, it seems like a wide field, but at the end of the day, it's you see the same faces, you see the same names over and over and over, which is good. It helps really bid, build collaborative efforts. Climate change. So this is kind of how Nick and I's paths crossed, yes. um, is for climate change adaptation. So I actually was going to talk about this, and I'm <coughs> going to ask someone and if anybody wants to explain to me what climate change is or global warming. Okay. Maybe take a quick stab at it. If you don't want to, that's fine, too. No I, I said I'd do it, but I was like, maybe someone else can do it. I'd say as greenhouse gases are accumulating, the, the wattage per square footage of heat radiating back is increasing by like one watt like per square foot, per square meter, something like that. It's like there's an LED light in every spot, every square meter of the earth. So it seems like one. Are you a science teacher? I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I basically climate science. At least. No. Um, yeah, and so that slow, small heating like all over the place is building up and accumulating, and it's not able to escape like it has in other times. And we work a lot with it. communication firms that come and tell us, like, because climate change is, like, it's a big bad bear, and it's not, like, got to communicate it well, and so they say, um, you know, emissions are being trapped in our atmosphere, and it's, like, a heating blanket, and it's, like, so simple to say it like that, but that's, like, the best way, and then you take it to your level, yeah. which is great, so. <laughs> 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 but it's essentially... Um, yeah, greenhouse gases warming our earth, Trapping changing heat. the climate. And I think for our discussion in our relevant field, you know, a lot of that heat is buffered by the ocean. The ocean is huge, and water has such a high heat capacity, it can take that heat and try to reach an equilibrium. And at the same time it's pushing heat into the ocean, that water is expanding in the ocean, because as water gets hotter, it expands. 
So the main driver is sea level rise. The second driver is land-based ice melting, the Greenland and Antarctica. And then here are just some of the other visual impacts, obviously. Um, we have ocean acidification. So our ocean is absorbing the same amount of CO2 that our atmosphere, well not the same, is also, it serves the same purposes. What's being absorbed in the atmosphere is being absorbed in our ocean. And our ocean has absorbed so much carbon in the past couple hundred years that it's 30% more acidic than it was in like 1750. Um, and what that does is as soon as the ocean waters are really, really acidic, it is essentially is not allowing um, animals that have um, shells or hard structures around themselves or coral reefs for that matter to have the calcium carbonate to build their, sh their backbones, their shells. Um, and Nick has a clever way because he's the scientist. I'm the you know, policy nerd. Clever way? Any more uh, about OA? It, it's, you know, you're, you're putting more, um, you're making this water more acidic, actually just like less basic and it's dissolving these shells. So these creatures are having a hard time just living, and then it transcends to reproduction, to eating, to competing against something else that may be dealing with it better. And that has a trophic cascade against all ecosystems. Right. Um, one thing that's really scary for surf rider is the sea level rise that Nick explained. Um, it causes shrinking <coughs> beaches. So that means there's, I always tell people that climate change is gonna impact sandcastle building and surfing. Uh, we don't have time to get into that, but when you have shrinking beaches and you have rising seas, it's a cascade of problems. And um, with the coral damage, um, it goes back to, to warm ocean temperatures. Mm -hmm. Essentially, there's um, algae that live inside coral, and when the water is too warm for them, they don't like it, they sponge themselves. And those little microbes and algae that are in there are what make the color of corals, and so when they leave, they're bleached. Um, anything else you want to hit on here? They're called zozanthillies. Zozanthillies? <laughs> um, anything else we should hit here? I think the next slide has like a pretty like hit list. Uh, oh, no. It's not supposed to be. So this is why we care, and some people might recognize this. I think this was December 2015 at the Ventura Pier. Wow. So these stats speak for themselves. In the you know in the global perspective, there's a lot of people living the coast. I think humans have always naturally gone to water, the rivers, but especially coastlines for navigation and food. Uh, in California, there's a lot of people that live in coastal counties, and they're very uh, dense. You know, San Francisco, Bay Area, LA, San Diego. Right. 40% of our population lives along the coast. So when you look at sea level rise or changing ocean conditions, that's going to impact a, a, an awful lot of people. And I think economically is, is absolutely critical. I mean, right now they say the ocean economy in California is $42 billion a year. Um, and when you start to throw in these changes of climate, you have huge economic problems. And going back to the talking points of experts when they train you to be simple and like not freak anybody out, like economics always comes into it. Mm -hmm. Everybody can relate to economics. Yeah, and another thing to think about for coastal hazards, it's very event-based. So it's like the El Nino that's gonna come is gonna do a whole lot of damage. Yes, there's a gradual trend that will do will have impacts, but it's that big event, it's that big storm that hits on the high tide that's gonna damage property, infrastructure, services, the whole lot. Ecosystems. Oh, yeah. So this is like the hit list. Uh, this is all the good news. This is all the good news. Uh, you know, it's just gonna be so stressful on ecosystems and species. It's gonna really test our capacity for drinking water and our water portfolios. Um, from Northern California to the other states that provide us like water, like the Colorado River. Um, yeah, we don't right. have to. We want to go through it. You, you get it. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be happy today. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be solution oriented. I swear to God, I was just going to say that. So here we go, look. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually going to literally fly through these slides. And so if you have more questions, write them down because I don't want to get too heavy. We've already kind of been super content heavy. Um, but essentially, we've only been working on climate change for two years. Um, and we kind of pronged out our approach. We um, Surf Rider. Surf Rider Foundation. Cool. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and so we try to do outreach and education. And to me, this is the most important thing that we're doing. Um, because just like how I was saying, we can simply explain to people what climate change is doing to our coast and ocean in a very simple way. It just raises the consciousness. And so for me, that's the most important. Um, we do shoreline and sea level rise planning. 
that's working with municipalities to plan for sea level rise and be like, hey, that wastewater treatment plant might be underwater in 50 years. Can we help you do some coastal land management to deal with that? Um, there's several different options you can consider. Or what, you know, what do you do to plan your shoreline for future sea level rise? Um, mitigation can serve two purposes. Oftentimes when people think of mitigation, they think of CO2 reduction. So that's like what Sierra Club and NRDC, they work on air quality, they work on the Clean, Water, or the Clean Air Act. We decided to do our ocean-friendly gardens, and I kind of mentioned that earlier, the soil is able to absorb, it's called carbon sequestration, um, and it helps with water quality, so it's great. And then, this is, this is my jam, um, policy reform. <laughs> Basically, working on um, <clears throat> lots of different things, which I will just get over and show you maybe in some of the future slides. Um, so, we're, we call ourselves boundary organizations because we help buttress what another organization is doing. And as all nonprofits do, you know, we help translate the hard science to make it simple. Um, then we, you know, basically take that regulatory language or the policy and give it to the, the layperson. Um, and essentially, you know, the advocacy that we've been talking about all night. Um, and then on the ground, like we're the ones who do like the dune restoration, like get your hands dirty. So like we kind of cover everything. But for me, the biggest thing that we do, which is so important, is shifting paradigms um, and getting people to, to think like long term versus short term and shifting that. Um, What's a conceptual future, like the OWL project you guys do? Um, but doing that, like in Hurricane Sandy happened, our East Coast chapters were, I didn't even put that picture in here, darn it. Um, they, they really were shocked. They, they got rocked from this. Um, and so the local community, including Governor Christie, was like, okay, we're gonna restore the shore. And we're like, well, that means like we build in the same place where you guys just got your butt kicks. Like, maybe we should rethink the shore. So that's the paradigm shift that, that we're, we're starting to look for. Um, we do trainings. So we have created, um, this is our climate change website. And these are all these different resources that we've put together in the past couple years. Um, I had an activist um, training where I trained 50 people. I'm going to actually open it to the public. Typically, it's just those people who belong in our um, actual chapter structure, but I think I'm going to open it up, so I'll send Dan the, the info for that. Um, and there's like a 20-page document that tells you everything, basically, that we're talking about tonight in words, in a folder. Um, just went over that. So in the shoreline planning, we don't need to, to go into that too much. Um, I think if we can get communities, local municipalities, to not build in the first place in bad places, then we'll have be in much better shape when CMRIs mm -hmm. does come. Um, and then there's there's places um, where we know that they need to actually do adaptation. And adaptation is, I'm gonna take it from like a huge macro level, and Nick is gonna go micro. Adaptation really just means how are we going to adapt to all of the changes that are happening from climate change. And there's so many different ways that people can do this, but we focus on coastal adaptation. And that means, again, looking at a municipality and saying, you need to raise that road, it's going to be flooded, or you need to move it back. So we provide different mechanisms to be able to ad adapt. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of time to figure that out. And we ensure it's incorporated into any development plan that people are going to try to put out there, because obviously we should have done that with this one. Um, managed retreat is uh, a concept that is very emotional, it's very contentious, um, it basically means move the structure completely away or demolish it entirely so that it is not going to be impacted. Um, we've been successful in certain places, which I'll be able to show you in a second. Um, retrofitting is, like I said, raising roads. That's part of adaptation. Um, rolling easements, so as the sea comes in, public access will be guaranteed, so the shoreline moves with public access. So say if this shoreline came in and they said, no, you can't really walk here, where you allow a, ro a rolling easement so that there will be continual access um, as the beach starts to shrink. These are all super progressive. Like, I'm like the crazy person in the room when I go say this because most people are like, we're not there yet, <laughs> but we will be soon. Unfortunately, it's just the inevitability of um, realizing this is what we need to do. Um, and then for, for me, this is one of the most, we had no idea we were, we were going to focus on this. It's like, after Hurricane Sandy, we were like, okay, we should, you know, 
and you know advocate for how you respond to extreme weather events. And now, I mean, this hurricane season, between all of the hurricanes this summer, I was working like around the clock with our chapters because they're like, oh my God, like this fell into the ocean and like, what do we do? And I'm like, well, you have to call a local municipality and get a permit from them to do a, a beach cleanup so you can pick up all this stuff and you need to have like, be trained. And you know, we're trying to get our activists to not only do the cleanups, but when they're there say, hey, I don't think we should probably rebuild in the same place because we're gonna get hit by sea level rise. Um, and just ensuring that after these extreme weather events, we're, we're there on the ground, being supportive, helping the community emotionally, actually, a lot of the time, um, and then through some of the physical stuff. Um, I won't go too much into the managed retreat, but this is a house in Oregon. Um, it, as you can tell, was closer to the shore, uh, to, the, to the bluff here. It's actually a second home for a couple, and they were gone for several years. And someone called them and were like, your house like, could legitimately could fall into the ocean right now. You might want to do something about it. So they called our local chapter in Portland, Oregon, and worked with our Coos Bay chapter. And they called a civil engineer and said, can you help us figure out how to move the house? And they did. They moved the house back 50 feet so that it wouldn't fall into the ocean. So that is the <laughs> perfect example. For 10 more years. That's for 10, good. thank you. <laughs> God, that was good. <laughs> um, so this is, this is adaptation. This is adapting to a potential problem. Um, and then of course we work on legislation that focuses on adaptation. Uh, we do it around the country. Surfers Point, um, just down the road from here, uh, up the road. Um, it's great, we were able to move this parking lot and pull it back, a bike path, um, and basically just make a lot of dunes here um, that would have never existed. The dunes that are there now actually absorb a lot of the wave action, and there was an El Nino that happened in 2015. This beach um, basically recouped itself. The sand went away, obviously, it washed out. Uh, then within the, the next summer, it was built back up. When you go closer down by the pier in Ventura, it did not recover because it didn't have the dunes, the cobble, and the, the living shoreline that was in place. Um, and this is my final dork slide, and I will end. Um, insurance reform. This is my biggest thing right now. It is super important. If the federal government stops giving people the same amount of money to build in the same exact places, we will be better off as a society because you're paying for it, you're paying for it, I'm paying for it, we're all paying to, what is that? Like doing the same thing over is considered insanity, whatever Einstein said. Like that's where we're trying to get <laughs> out of, right? Um, and so when you force someone to say, hey, you know what, we're not gonna give you that money, it forces adaptation because they can no longer build in the same place. And in Florida, of all places, their governor banned the word climate change legitimately through the legislature, like cannot say it. So instead of saying climate change to them, we said coastal hazards, and we went along with Jarvis taxpayers and the Tea Party. This was like during the Tea Party era. And they were like, this is crazy. Like surfers and Tea Party, like their minds were just like, um, because we're saving you taxpaying dollars. And so the governor was like, yeah. So they banned state subsidies for very wealthy people to get state money to build in the same place. Um, huge success, and now we're trying to do that around other states and at the national level. And dune restoration, this is the positive right to it. So here's our North Carolina chapter in Cape Fear. Um, every year for the past 12 years, there's a really cool video, but I don't have time to show it. Um, they take Christmas trees and they anchor them up into the dune, they tie them down, they cover them with sand, and the next year the dune is bigger. Mm -hmm. And having dunes is a great thing for resiliency because it's able to absorb potential wave action, sea level rise, um, building habitat, again, potential, if there's dunes there with plants, potential carbon sequestration. Um, and it's a really good feeling to feel like I just built that dune. Um, I have a lot of volunteers and like they, they're so, they feel like they own it, right? Like mm -hmm. then you're a better steward and again, engagement, right? Um, and then this is fascinating because this area um, was just wiped out for um, Hurricane Sandy. And um, it's starting to come back. And every year they plant these dune plugs. They're called plugs. Um, and they go out there and anybody can do it. And again, they're building these awesome resilient coastlines. And so we're really stoked to be part of building resilient coastlines um, through our chapter network. So like the OWL viewer or uh, 
um, perhaps uh, the mobile app, you know, we work with a lot of technology to try to engage people to have access to these resources. So I'd encourage you, if you have time and interest, to go look at the Our Coast, Our Future. You Google that, you'll find it. This is a tool that Point Blue made in partnership with USGS. It's a great dynamic model for sea level rise and coastal erosion. The green is low-lying areas. That's Malibu. That is Malibu. And it gets flooded. <laughs> um, I won't go into too much of it, but basically it's a really cool model for any science search because it's dynamic. A lot of the traditional models are static, so it just like throws water on a digital elevation model. But the Cosmos model puts in some seasonal effects, storm surge, and throws a 100-year storm at that uh, area, and it also evolves the beach. Um, it's pretty cool, something that we work on. But as Steph was saying, talking about adapting, these are just like basic good idea stuff. So if you're going to build a hospital, you might not want to put it on a fault line. <laughs> you're avoiding the hazard. Maybe if the hazard is something you can deal with, you accommodate it. Maybe if it's too hot out, you put an air conditioner. Things like that. So these are general ideas you can think about for adapting on a coastal setting. Part, you know, avoid, accommodate, retreat, soft protection, hard protection. This is a neat area uh, up um, by Half Moon Bay over here. It's called Double Slide. Highway 1 used to go over here, and there's a huge mudslide here that happened. So what did they do? Uh, the Coastal Commission, in partnership with the Coastal Conservancy, I think, California Fish and Wildlife, they just built a tunnel. And now this is an awesome hike and bike trail. It's really cool. Every time I've gone there, I've seen whales. There's a big bird nest that roosts down there. I forgot the type of bird, but it's, it's great. So this would be considered moving away for some. Accommodating, maybe? One of the ways you can do this adaptation is called a living shoreline. As you can see on this kind of scale, you go from a really hard seawall, bulkhead revetment, to maybe some greener, putting in some plants, having habitat, having ecosystems, to something really, really green with vegetation or maybe a sand dune. And this is another um, strategy you can use in your coastal planning. So I would say this is you know, kind of like on that accommodate, protect level. This is an image of a place in northern Santa Monica Bay where the Bay Foundation, uh, basically these are just windscreens. They're saying, okay, we're going to stop grooming in Santa Monica Bay. Grooming happens all the, ever, almost every day. Tractor comes with little rigs, picks up all the trash. They also pick up all the rack and maybe snowy clover eggs and other sensitive species. So this sand screen is designed to help try to seed a dune system to provide not only habitat, but potentially coastal protection for the homes back here. So this is kind of like the before, and then the computer-generated artist <laughs> rendition of the beautiful habitat with birds everywhere and people enjoying it. Um, they, this is from last year, I think, but they, you know, they seeded it, they've had rains, um, and it actually has changed elevation. Are you guys flying drones from mm -hmm. on this? Yeah. So you can maybe speak to how much it's accreted in? Oh, uh, I want to say about a meter and a half or so. Yeah, which is wow. a lot for pretty much low maintenance of putting up sand screens. They pick up trash, and I think that's pretty much all they do. Um, so that's a really cool project. To yeah, they, they have less trash inside. Oh, that's right. Which they is the most interesting thing. They have less trash inside it than they have around. Presumably because the the they're not doing the grooming. The grooming takes a plastic bag and then turns it into lots of small pieces. Where in there, it's easy to do like once a month hand pick and, yeah. and remove it. So this is a, I think it's about a year and a half, almost. Yeah, almost two years. Almost yeah. two years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So maybe soft protection type of strategy. Oh, this is from our friends in the Netherlands. So as you can <laughs> this is a parking lot. These are this is like their promenade. This is like Third Street, Venice Boardwalk. This is a nice dune. So what they did was all these pavilions, you know, they get flood on a huge storm. So they built this underground parking lot to still keep that asset, keep that resource that they wanted. They wanted parking. All these restaurants wanted parking. People wanted to be able to drive to the beach and park their car. So they put it underground and built this beautiful dune on top of it. And a really neat creative solution to losing the view for these restaurants, cafes, is during the their spring when it's not really stormy, they have temporary pavilions that take two weeks to put up. They're there for the season. Take them down when it's threaded in storms. 
and use this as protection for their really hard uh, structures. Not appropriate everywhere. There's also like groundwater issues to deal with, but it's a creative solution that I don't think anyone in California has ever really proposed. So, why? <laughs> um, and then this is my own. Odd on just a normal sunny day, there's a whole lot of people. And something that I always try to encourage when talking to communities about adapting is you kind of have to know where you came from to kind of think about where you are now and where you might be in the future. That was 1920s. Pretty much the same spot. <laughs> Not a lot's changed. There's still a couple people at the beach. <laughs> same um, amount of tattoos. Yeah, yeah. Um, and people liked the beach back then, and we've persisted to still like the beach. So we need to make sure we continue to do that in, in, fun, in creative solutions that preserve the assets we like. So this is, you know, 1890s. Something really interesting about Santa Monica Bay is that there's been a lot, a lot of uh, coastal management and a beach nourishment putting sand on the beachway that we've modified as humans. This is the old Venice Pier. I don't know how many are you familiar with Santa Monica Bay and Venice area. So this is back in the you know, 1930s. Nice roller coaster, a couple roller coasters. Every this, beach needs a roller coaster. Every beach needs a roller coaster. <laughs> um, but what was interesting is in the 1940s, there is over 35 million cubic yards of sand placed on the beaches. You can see this right here. You know what that used to be? That used to be the end of the pier. And now it's the breakwater that I go surf all the time. <laughs> Wow. This whole this whole beach is human engineered. It's modified. We adapted, so to speak. And that human alteration of our resources, I, I think, prevents a lot of people from thinking about creative solutions for preserving what we like. Mm -hmm. So this is what LA used to look like. I mean, albeit it's pretty cool and still very, very urbanized. Little narrow beaches than, beaches than we have now. And you can mm -hmm. see here, um, the good idea is this bridge is that bridge right there. So the beach is significantly wider all along here, especially right here. And we already do adaptation. These are temporary storm um, sand berms that are put up by LA County beaches and harbors every winter. We're already doing soft protection. If this program perhaps is you know, extended to six months out of the year for five years, and then maybe it's 10 months out of the year, for five years, and then maybe it's just year round with plants, with nice meandering boardwalks like we saw in uh, Surfers Point today that are manicured by volunteers, by the community, by stewards of the environment. Maybe we'll get some stone colors, maybe we'll get some other type of uh, uh, really cool animal there and preserve what we all like, which is obviously the beach. Um, so last local policy thing is right now, Venice is going through, Venice is a part of the city of LA, and it's going through its update of its local coastal program, which is its guiding document for a plan that the Coastal Commission has to certify to streamline uh, processes to bring regulation from the state to the locals. And this is kind of like a super draft map of potential impacts to the area with resources. And we work with them uh, to help engage the community, to help communicate the science, and help try to create community solutions. Venice is going through a lot of changes on a socioeconomic level and uh, gentrification. So focusing uh, this workshop on like sea level rise planning is not always the easiest when people come in and want to talk about rent prices. But <laughs> it's it's how I've connected with the local surf rider chapter to try to get people that are, you know, are on the fringes of wanting to be involved of how to, how to of uh, getting them to understand this is how a city planning process works. This is how a public workshop goes. This is how you can have your impact, your input into a long-term community plan. And um, with that, I think we're ready for questions. Okay. Thank you.